Section 5.2, our last section of new material. We're still working with integers. In 5.1, we worked with integers in terms of addition and subtraction. And in 5.2, we're going to look at multiplication and then division. So we're going to start with multiplication, and we're going to start with the same models that we used when we were doing addition and subtraction, um, at least at the beginning. We're going to start with the chip model. All right, so if we were doing a chip model and you were doing whole numbers, um, so positive values in particular, not even whole numbers, maybe let's talk about natural numbers, um, and you wanted to do something like 3 times 5, um, you could either think of that as 3 chips put in in groups of 5 or 5 chips put it in groups of 3, okay? So kind of like our repeated addition idea from when we did do whole numbers. Or you could maybe even think of it as when we did like the array model, right? A 3 by 5 array of objects. However, what we're going to be looking at in this section is negative integers, in particular causing problems for that imagery that we were looking at. So I'm going to show you a way to describe or to think about this in terms of those red chips that we were doing, okay? So we're going to, and you can switch the four and the three in terms of my description. It doesn't make any difference. I'm just going to pick one. So we're going to pick the first one as being a removal. So a negative meaning to remove. And we're going to remove four groups. Because it's the number four. So negative for the removing, or the, the word remove for the negative. Four because it's the number four. Okay? So if you don't like that, you could say we're going to point out the negative three and say remove three groups of, okay? And then the other object over here is going to be three red chips. Three because it's the number three in that parentheses and red because it is a negative. So in this object, if this had said negative four and it had said times three, we would say it's removing four groups of three black chips because that three would be represented a positive quantity. That's how it would change based on whether it was a positive or negative there, okay? So let's take a look at a circle. So create yourself a circle. And in your circle right now, there's nothing there. Agreed? And what we wanna do is we wanna remove four groups of three red chips. Well, the only way that's gonna happen is if there's some chips to remove, agreed? So we're starting with zero and we're going to keep our circle at a value of zero. And we did that when we did some subtraction stuff last class period. Do you remember how we actually put things into the circle without changing what the value was inside the circle? Pairs. Zero pairs. And just a reminder, a zero pair is a positive and a negative both put in at the same time. Or in the case of this model, a red chip and a black chip both put into the circle at the same time. Now, our goal eventually, and we know looking at this, is to have 12 things in here to remove, right? Four times three is 12. There's no question about that. We're going to have to be removing 12 red chips at some point. So as you're thinking about this, we're going to put in zero pairs, and I'm going to put in 12 black chips and 12 red chips. As long as I put in the same number of them, this is still the value zero, agreed? So our circle still has the value zero. There's a whole heck of a lot in it, but it's worth nothing right now, right? This is like looking at your bank account and it's saying $60, but you know full well that you've already spent that $60 because you gave somebody a $60 check. That's what's going on, okay? A lot going on that was worth nothing. All right, what we're gonna do then is we're gonna remove four groups of three red chips. So we're gonna group our chips in groups of three and we're gonna remove them. And there will be four groups of three that we remove if I've inserted them correctly anyway. Looks like I did. And when I do that, what is left? What was that, Catherine? 12, 12 positive chips. 12 positive chips. And in our case, those are black chips for what I'm drawn. Yours may be a different color. And again, just like we did last time, if you're using different colors besides the standard black and red, please tell me what you're letting be positives, maybe negatives. 
So this is positive, this is negative on my screen. Those are the standard colors to use for that. If you're using something different, just let me know what you're using, okay? So again, the answer to this question then is that it's eight. Oh, I'm sorry, thank you. I don't know why I said eight. Apparently I was wanting there to be eight, I don't know. Twelve, yes, the answer is twelve. Um, this is a visual to help us to justify why the negative times the negative was positive. Okay? It may not be a convincing visual to you, but it might be a convincing visual to someone else. It's one of the things in your toolbox to be able to talk about why a negative times a negative is a positive. Now, the second model is the chip model, or is the uh, charged fields model, and of course it looks much like the chip model. Um, so let's a reminder of how this particular model works. It's still going to have the same thing. We are going to be removing four groups of three negatives, so three negative charges in this case. So our circle is going to start out with nothing in it, and we're going to put in zero pairs. And we're going to put in 12 positive charges along with 12 negative charges. It's worth zero. And then we're going to remove groups of three negative charges. I need a different color because there's too much of the same color going on. And when I do that, I'm going to be left with 12, not 8, 12 positive charges for an answer of 12. <coughs> okay, charge fields, chip models, they're the same model. We recognize that. Um, the resources that you use in your classroom may lend themselves better to one or the other, or it may actually only have one or the other inside of what you're doing and teaching, so just to be aware of. Okay, we're going to do the number line model. I'm going to tell you right now I don't like the number line model for multiplication, so I don't mean that to sort of dissuade you against it, but I find it to be presented in a way that's less convincing than what we just did. Okay, so that was a really positive outlook, I know. <laughs> Super helpful and exciting right there. But we're going to give it a go anyway. So here is the way that this is described with your book. The negative is going to indicate that we move left. And that part I'm fine with, right? Negative means move left. Four at a time, because there's a number four there. So we're sort of skip counting or skip jumping by, by number four. Four at a time. This is the part that I don't care much for. This actually will say that the time starts, they're using the number hour, the word hours, there's nothing special about hours, but we're just going to go with it. That's not a four, that's a three. You just thought you saw a four. Um, the time starts three hours ago. So let me try visually what it's talking about as it describes it with that language. Okay, so here's your number line. You're going to put a zero in here. And we know we're jumping four at a time. Whoops, that's supposed to be an eight. And there's my 12. And we know we're supposed to be moving left. And in this model, you always end up back at zero. So this is the visual of what it looks like. And the answer to the question is, where did you start? So this is the picture, this is the setup. Let me actually use it with the language in there now that's being used. 
You're moving left four at a time, and this time is starting 12, or sorry, three hours ago. So you start at the number 12, and you end at the starting point zero. The question is, where did you start? And you started at 12. Now, I don't like this model. However, there is a really good example of it in your book where you can see it being used. And it talks about, um, you'll see, it, I'm pretty sure it's in your group work, so we'll encounter it in class next time. And it talks about enrollment statistics. If the enrollment in the school, or whatever, is decreasing 50 students a year, and it's done this for the past three years, how many students has it decreased overall? And the answer would actually end up being a positive because it's a decrease of 150 students. So it has a good application where it's describing it in that way. I'm just not super convinced that the number line gives a lot of um, clarity to what's going on in this particular example. But this is one of them. All right, let's look at a little bit more in terms of integer multiplication. These aren't models, but this is just a little bit more information. A and B be integers, okay? So positive, negative, or zero. If A is negative and B is negative, so what happens based on what we just discovered or saw when two numbers are negative? They end up being positive. So when we multiply the two numbers together, what ends up happening is it's actually the same as the absolute value of A times the absolute value of B. This is one way of interpreting it. Because they were both negative, when you multiply them together, you get both positives. Another version is you could write it with the A and the B in multiplication together inside of the absolute values and then take the absolute value when you're done. It, it doesn't make any difference. The point is that when you're done, you get positive values. And absolute values, as we discussed in the last section, in section 5.1, give us a positive quantity, right? Absolute value is a positive length, or zero if we've got zero involved, of course. The second one actually talks about what happens when one value is positive, the other one's negative. So for instance, if A is less than zero and B is greater than zero, or if A is greater than zero and B is less than zero, so one positive and one negative, what kind of number do you get then when you multiply them together? You get a negative, right? One's positive, one's negative. So again, in terms of mathematics, to make sure that it's really negative, we're gonna write the negative, and then we're gonna write the absolute value notation afterwards. Or again, you could write the negative and put them both together inside of an absolute value and it would mean the same thing. So the answer is the same number you get when you multiply A times B, but then it's negative because one of them was positive, the other one was negative when you were done. Okay. So these are facts. These are facts that can be explored and justified with one of those diagrams that we just did. That would be okay. So if you were doing it with a chip model or a charged fields model, you could justify that you do get, in fact, get a negative or do, in fact, get a positive. All right. Properties of multiplication. These are the same properties that we keep seeing over and over and over again. They never change. All right? So properties of multiplication. What does the closure property say? Right, so if you apply it to integers the way we did to whole numbers, if you multiply two integers, you get an integer, right? Cannot multiply two integers and get a fraction. I don't multiply two integers and get a radical, okay? So if I multiply two integers together, I will get an integer. So A times B is a, not only is it an integer, is a unique integer. Commutative, in terms of multiplication, what does the commutative property look like? Right. A times B is equal to B times A. Commutative switches the order of multiplication. How about the associative property? Somebody else. Be bold. Tell us what the associative property looks like. Excellent. So good job, Beth. She left the order the same. It goes A, B, C, A, B, C. The only thing that changed is the location of the parentheses, right? What's actually residing inside of them. All right, I think there's three more. Identity property. So 
What is the identity element for multiplication? What about? Yeah, it's the number one. The identity element for multiplication is the number one. What's the identity element for addition? That's zero. So be careful on which one you're talking about. It is the number one for multiplication. So what does the identity property look like with that number one? A times 1 equals A. There's one more part to it. Do you remember it, Ellen? Okay, somebody help her out. Yeah, we can do it the other way as well. 1 times A is equal to A. And we talked about that being a needed fact because um, if you don't have both directions of it, then we end up with weird things happening with division and subtraction for that matter in the number zero, right? So it has to work in both directions. The distributive property, I'll write it down, is A times the quantity B plus C is equal to AB plus AC. And you can actually look at it from the other perspective as well. That is, if the addition were first and the multiplication were second, like this, it's the same way. In fact, I'll write it the other direction just so that the order doesn't change and let you think that it has to. So this is BA plus CA. BA plus CA. All right, and the last one is the zero multiplication property. So what happens when you multiply by zero? You get zero. That is the exact exciting fact about zero is that A times zero or zero times A is equal to A. And you, the zero, of course, just like the number one for the uh, multiplicative identity is, oh, it doesn't equal A. My bad. How about zero there? Thank you, Catherine. Um, just like with the um, additive identity, the number one is a unique number here. The number zero is the unique number that does this. No other number does it. All right, so just for fun, you guys are going to do example number four, just for fun, right? I want you to write in what property you're seeing presented in each of the four parts, okay? So you have six different properties we just discussed. Which identity or which uh, property is evident in each of the four examples that you have? So just jot one of them down. If you need to change it, you can always mark it out. What was the property on part A? That's closure. It just tells you that if two numbers are multiplied, there are an element of the integer. So this is the closure property. What's the second one, part B? That's the zero property. How about the third one, C? Distributive, very good. And D. That's commutative. Very nice. All right, just a few more properties and we'll wrap up for today. The first one says that for every integer a, negative 1 times a is negative a. You guys know that one, right? If you multiply by a negative, you get negative of that, or the opposite of that value for that integer. Theorem 5.7 says that for all integers a and b, if you have the opposite of a times b, it is the same thing as being the opposite of a, b. In some sense, that one right there is basically the commutative property in action, representing that the negative is like the number negative 1. It's much like the commutative property. The second part of Theorem 5.7 says if you have the opposite of a times the opposite of b, it's the same thing as a times b. Again, you've got two negatives present on the numbers A and B in front of them, and those cancel each other out, or they multiply to be a positive 
whatever phrasing it is that you like there. And then on theorem 5.8, what you actually have is you have the distributive property present for subtraction. It's separated out sep on this, in this section anyway, they separate it out differently. So for integers a, b, and c, a times b minus c is a, b minus a, c. And b minus c times a is b, a minus c, a. It's just a variation of the distributive property. Any question on that? All right.